So, I mean, we can start maybe with the intro, but first, even before people know who you are, I'm impressed that you, I've been reading a lot about your business and what you're doing. It's, you're running a multi-million rand business at the moment, which you're running from your own home. This is a very new concept in today's world. Um, I don't know if this was planned before or what were you thinking before you actually made it happen? I had another business about 10 years ago, a recruitment mm. business. Yeah. And, uh, and I couldn't afford to pay the rent on office space for that one. Right. So I landed up working from home. And after a year of working from home mm. and not seeing anybody in Johannesburg, then I decided I might as well move to Cape Town. Yeah. So I moved to Cape Town and I ran the recruitment business for about, I think, like eight or nine years. So the truth is, is, you know, if you have to and you don't have the cash for office space, yeah. then you have no choice. Well, your only option is I'm still going to carry on working from home. Right. So now the new business can afford to have offices, <laughs> but then you like, I'm better off staying at home. D definitely. <laughs> An interesting uh dichotomy there but um so uh, your intro how do you when you meet people at the dinner tables how do you introduce yourself so it's a very good question i just want to also mention i think that uh, office space is going to become redundant yeah so how i introduce myself is <clears throat> i try i always try to downplay mm. what i actually do because it's just easier that way yes and so i, I really just say that we have a a, a business an actuary consulting business mm. And, uh, and I work on the admin side, on the operational side. Uh, I'm kind of the air traffic controller for the business. And um, so that's the easiest way to do it. <clears throat> if they dive deeper and mm -hmm. they ask some proper questions, then they'll probably realize that uh, we have quite a substantial actuary consulting business. And, uh, and I, I try to manage and make sure that the actuaries or doing brilliantly so that's uh, that's what I spend my time doing is, is interacting between the clients and the actuaries and making sure that everybody involved is doing brilliantly mm -hmm. so I don't know what you call that right <laughs> that's a good point I think most people these days are having trouble to kind of explain exactly what they do because when people ask oh what do you do they still expect one thing that they will understand that you can explain you know yeah. it's interesting so before we get into everything else how did you even you're not an an actuary, right? an actuary yourself no. right I, and i have a lot of actuarial friends oh. so if you give me their first name i'll tell you what their surname is you don't <laughs> have to do it now but that's a little game i'll play oh, okay yeah so we can do that so where did you see the gap in the market and for you to see that okay you can take it upon yourself to actually do it because i had spent so many years working as a recruiter mm. of actuaries i got to know the industry right and so that's where i spotted the gap how I got to this point is uh, it's quite a long story. We can always we can dabble into that as well. Mm. But pretty much what happened was, you know, I've I've been in, in, in sales and marketing and, and and interacting with clients for many, many years. Mm. You know, like a lot of people that maybe didn't get a degree, you go into business. Mm. You know, business means you're not a professional. You know, you don't have a set job that you do. You just you go into trying to be a sort of like a business person, whatever that means. And so that's what I was over the years. Mm. Worked in different co companies. I, I sold advertising. I, I, I worked in, um, in some other corporate roles, mainly in a sales capacity. And that's what happens if you're a business person. You, you try to move to improve. So as you progress and as you get more confident, you're able to interact with other people who give you a chance to work with them. Right. You move to improve. And so as the years progressed, I, I got a, a job in a recruitment business that recruited actuaries. All right. And when I got into that industry, I was like, wow, I love this industry. Such awesome people. So much integrity. I just love the caliber of the people. Probably the best type of client I ever had. And so what happened was I, I held on to that. And then I opened my own recruitment business. And then I, I kind of like really wanted to hold on to the industry. Mm -hmm. So then having worked in the in industry for quite a few years, I spotted the gap. The gap that I realized was that independent actuaries couldn't scale them themselves, their time, their money as an independent. So that was kind of like the gap that I spotted. So that's how I got into it. I, I actually met somebody at a bar um, before an airplane flight. Mm. 
And you know, you never know when it's just going to come out of thin air. Yeah. You're interacting with somebody. Oh, what do you do? What are you involved in? You just, the truth is you're always hoping someone's going to say to you, you won't believe your luck. We just bought a gold mine or a diamond mine just down the road from where you stay. Yeah. And you look like just the kind of guy that could help us manage it. And in fact, if you come in nice and early, we'll give you some shares. That's always what you hope to hear. Right, right, right. <laughs> Which never, excuse me, it never happens. Mm. But you still have those conversations because you don't know where it will lead to. Yeah, this for is sure. really about networking and having a positive attitude. Mm. You don't want to be moping around. Oh, I do this, it's myth, you know. You kind of like want to be proud of what you do, but enthusiastic to maybe get involved in something else. Right, that's for sure. So then I met somebody at a bar. He managed a recruitment business that recruited actuaries, and that's how I got that job. How did you understand that uh, for a lot of people watching now, they actually, what do actuaries actually do? So the first thing to say is that actuaries work in different sectors. Mm. They work in banking. They work in life insurance and general insurance. They work in pensions, healthcare, and investments. Yes. So that's kind of like your starting point. And a banking actuary would do different things to a life actuary. But in essence... The actuaries develop the products, so whether it's a credit card product, a home loan product, a life insurance or a funeral product, um, a general insurance, um, home insurance. Mm. So they develop the products. They are known as product development actuaries. Then they once that's developed, then they pass it on to the to the pricing actuaries. They then price the product. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then once they then sell and distribute the products, it's about doing the valuations and, and the reporting on the business itself. Do they have enough reserves? Should there be a major event? You know, capital management, um, solvency, can the business, it, will the business be solvent, mm -hmm. solvent if quite a big event happens? So you get different types of actuaries. And then, um, and then on the healthcare side, they do quite a bit of different things. And pensions actuaries help to manage the pension fund money. They, they evaluate the pension fund, its performance. And then on the investment side, it, it, it also it goes like down a rabbit hole. So the truth is actuaries do a lot of different things. But in essence, by definition, actuaries use financial and statistical models, I guess like Excel, mm -hmm. to calculate a risk. Right. So those so risk could be the pricing or the product itself is it, or, or, or the valuation. So, so that's kind of what actuaries do. It's probably one of the best careers you can go into. Right. But also de definitely one of the most difficult to pass. So I think you're probably born an actuary. Right. Okay, you know, that's interesting. If you're like head boy, head girl, mm. and like straight A's and six, seven, eight, like, oh, you got five, six A's. Ah, that's nothing. She got 13. Yeah. So then she probably will want to become an actuary because actuaries are problem solvers. Let's go back first to when where, where you're getting started and back in your de uh, days of be becoming a DJ. I'll say even younger than that, say at Eight years old, what were you trying to do at that point? Or what were you thinking your future would look like? Where were you? So I always had, I had a great upbringing. Mm. Sport, BMX, shooting pellet guns, building tree houses. So I, I, I did enjoy interacting with people. Yeah. And, um, and I, I loved playing TV games when I was younger. I don't play TV games now, but I, I really used to enjoy it. So I think that... Like Super Mario and stuff? Super Mario, all that stuff. Mm. Uh, um, uh, Mortal Kombat, finish him, you know, like beautiful, you know. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. So I was always an outgoing person who, who loved creative stuff. At the same time, what I also realized was that I, was, I really enjoyed fixing things and taking something and, and, and making it work by taking other pieces from other things and, and then making something work. Of just being creative mm. I, I was I wasn't stifled I was encouraged by the family that's actually why when I decided to leave university and and go into being a DJ they said okay well I mean you know if that's what you want to do yeah so yeah I think when I was younger it was a good childhood it was it was about interacting with people in the community at who were really successful business people I think that was quite a pillar mm -hmm. and and feeling like you deserve a seat at the table but now that you're at the table you know, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah. You know, is what's going to come out of your mouth quality or are you just garbage. making sense? Is it garbage? Yeah. So that was the upbringing, yeah. 
and and then at that point were you thinking w- was your family kind of channeling you into a certain direction or did you have your own ambitions of becoming a pilot or a doctor or that kind of thing or you just wanted to be rich it's a great question i think that it was always always mm. supposed to be a bcom marketing thing. i was going to go into business of some sort yeah i come from a business family a working family and it was always going to be business always I was never ever going to do like become a pilot that mm-hmm. didn't even cross my mind. It was always business. But then the truth is is when business school didn't work then I'd go hey, you know, I actually want to do the arts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Um but yeah, I was always supposed to go into some sort of a business role of some sort. The truth is what I always wanted was like you know, sort of Deutsche Bank, RMB, like Absa Capital, you know, Investec. Mm-hmm. Woo! you know proper life. Well, what what did you attract it? what were you what attracted you to those entities? Loving these questions. So what attracted me was on like a Friday night mm. when you would go for dinners to people's houses or they would come over there would you would generally see the guys that had families mm. kids running around and they were business people. Yeah. And they seemed to be pretty organized. You know they weren't like the the dirty uncle, you know? <laughs> you know who kind of like is is doesn't have his life together yeah, really in that you, way, yeah. You know, you always kind of looked up to those who were smart, had, you know, careers of some sort with business people and yeah. we're talking about deals, you know, they were involved in different things. Mm. You know, there were different strategies in in how they managed to get something at a reduced rate and they were able to to get the 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 sign off to have exclusivity on the product and they were now pushing this item for the last 12 to 18 months they just their figures have skyrocketed yeah that for me was like whoa, look at this oh, wow. even if you don't know what it meant at the point you're just like yeah th- yeah this is it you don't know what it means but what you do know mm. is that he can afford to go on a saturday and sunday away fishing right because here this guy his career is sorted during the week but on the weekends he's having fun riding his motorbike or horse riding or mountain biking whatever it is yeah and you wanted that you wanted that story to tell mm-hmm. i'm a business person and i have extracurricular hobbies that i do that was like the allure like ah the goal if you could be the guy at the friday night table that had a story to tell mm-hmm. with a partner then that was kind of what, what you, i wanted yeah that's interesting so now when you transitioned so we went to college things didn't work out did you feel like oh maybe this thing that i wanted it's kind of too big out of my league Or how did you feel at that point? I've always just followed my passion. Mm. And when I see something I just dive in. Right. No, no, but I, what I'm trying to understand is when that felt, did yes. you feel like oh, this is did you see it as a as an end point of like I was trying to go get it and now it doesn't seem like I can I can do it or I, it was I, just like okay, I just have to figure out another way. I was too young to decide whether I had got it right or wrong. What right. I did know was that I was I was becoming a DJ and for me this was my everything. Oh, okay, okay. So I thought I got it right because this was my everything. This was my destiny. Mm. My destiny was to play Tomorrowland, you know, like mm. up on that big stage. That was my destiny. The problem is when I hit the age of like 25, 26 mm. and I came back from London, this is the problem and the guys that had gone to Deutsche Bank had gone to RMB had gone to Investec and Standard Bank and all these like fancy schmancy places Swiss Re Insurance Munich Re Power mm. these guys hadn't had as much fun as me in my opinion yeah but they were sorted they were they had awesome cars they had nice wives you know they seemed to have children houses and I was like damn damn I got <laughs> it wrong buddy you know like they became exactly what you wanted to to see before and and the dj didn't work out right so now you stuck with a quarter life crisis you're like oh my God. a quarter life crisis yeah yeah and so and so at that point i realized i got it wrong mm. and so the only way is to start from the ground up you have to no one's going to give you money no one's going to just give you a job you have to go out there and get one and then once you got it and then you try to make the best of the bad situation you didn't get your degree you didn't get that awesome job so now you're trying to just survive and make it. So you, so what happens is you start to not be able to hang out with the professionals. Yeah, yeah, for sure because the industries are to begin with very spread out and also the the income levels play a role, eh? You can't afford to hang out with them because 
they're all talking about their mountain bikes ah. and how they're going on the Ironman thing and you can't even pay your rent in the small cottage that you're renting somewhere. Mm-hmm. You, you, can't, you can't be hanging around with them because they will invite you for dinner or lunch to hang out with them yeah. but inevitably, oh, they're going trail running on Sunday. Would you like to join them? Trail running? Like, I can't even, like, I have to buy new tackies. I, you know, like, I'm struggling to survive here. So you can't keep up, basically, with you, those. You can't keep up. So, right. so you land up not interacting with them. Yeah, that's a sad story, but that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happens in life, I think. You know, just one of those. There are people who probably now cannot hang out with you anymore now, also because you're talking about something else, you know? Yeah, well, I just want to remind them that I am approachable. Right. And I would love to chat with them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now... <clears throat> You seem, I mean, you seem like you have an attitude of a personality of a sales guy. You can sell things. Did you even ever got into sales at all? So sales is my main forte. Okay. That, like that's actually what I do. Seems like you're an actual sales guy. Yeah. So, so yeah, so an actuarial sales guy, exactly. Mm. So a natural sales guy, yes. So they they told me uh, as the years progressed, mm. I would hear nonstop. Jeez, you're a, you're a great salesman. Okay. As the years progress, so, you know, you have to be charming. You have to be understanding of who you're interacting with. Mm. You have to be professional. You know, don't look like an idiot. Don't, don't talk and act like an idiot. So, yeah, so sales was actually my main thing. So, as the years progressed, I, I got a role selling certain products, and then you'd move over to the next company, move to improve, then the product was better. Mm. So, sales was my, sales is my main thing. So what moved you from that point, the quarter life crisis, to where you kind of got your things together? Was it sales? So it was sales. Mm. So what happened was, as a salesman, you always hope. And I think that, I hope that this will resonate with a lot of people. When you're a salesperson, what it really means is you can do it. Mm. Like someone brings you into their business, they sell hats or they manufacture shoes or they in business, there's always, quite often there's a sales team, even if it's financial products, somewhere along the line. Of course, has to sell. Someone has to sell. Someone has to be able to interact with the clients. These days, it's more advanced. <coughs> Excuse me. These days, it moves into online sales and marketing. Now, now, I do that now and in my opinion, quite well. Mm-hmm. That's purely based on a more advanced type of sales. You, you know, your online presence now. Yeah, for sure. all sales. Oh, that's a very good point. A lot of what you do these days in the digital age to be able to get booked, I got booked to speak in the US in January at an actuary convention Mm. about disruption in the actuarial world. I do some talks. One of the topics that I talk about is disruption. Yeah, for sure. And so how does one get to a point where you get invited? Well, you're selling yourself on LinkedIn. So you're on LinkedIn, you have a presence, you have a profile. You have newspaper articles about your business. Yes. You're there. It's all, it's, it's show and tell. This is who we are. We open for business. You want, if you would like to engage with us, our door is open. That's sales. And so what happens is you mold as a salesperson to be able to have, to do door to door sales, to do tele sales. Mm. So now you're just on the telephone. There's a technique there. Yeah. Then there's corporate sales. It's all about your, your manner in the boardroom. How do you dress? How do you present yourself? Right. Did you shave? That's not going to fly in the corporate world. For sure. So what happens is there's a lot of facets to being a salesperson, but then it, gets, it goes beyond that. So now you're a salesperson. Now you open a business. You're going to sell some stuff. What you don't want as a salesperson is returns or, or hiccups. Mm-hmm. So you then land up getting involved in the terms of business and the contracts that your business puts together. Because ultimately, you see, any business that you're running, if you're in sales, and sales and business person is the same word. Entrepreneur, sales, and business person, it's the same word. I agree with you there. So what happens is if you now want to make an app and you want to launch the app, if people are going to buy it, there's got to be terms of usage. For sure. So who's going to come up with the terms of usage? You have to. Because as the salesperson, when the client has a problem, they phone you first. Yeah. You're pretty much running, the, you're managing the whole business. Yeah. Management just kind of comes in and, hey, how's everything going? You're like, I've, I've got it under control. Well, I've got it under control means you're doing everything. Mm-hmm. So I think sales is key. And I think that most of the people that are up and coming 
have to be able to market and sell themselves. That also means when you get invited to now come to a conference. Okay, what you're going to do? Right. Okay, Mr. Big Shot, you want to, you know, you want to have a big fancy car and a big fancy house. Okay, well, here, here's your opportunity. Step up to the plate. Let's see your presentation. Oh, that's sales. Because if you get it right, the ramifications are wonderful. Yes. And if you get it wrong, you're going to look like a doers. And people are going to be like, Right. Rather leave the public speaking to someone else. For sure. So you have to become a better salesperson, a better business person in any business that you're doing. That's my opinion. It's not good enough to say, I don't get involved in the technical aspect of our product. Because then you've lost the moment with the client. You see, that, that is something that people, not only in the sales side would say, but it's just like anyone like to... Pretty much a lot of people like to eliminate themselves. In so, you know, I just get involved with this is what I do. On the sales part, I don't want to get involved or the technical part. And then, you know, it seems like the more you know, the more it just helps you better, whether as a salesman or in whatever industry you're doing. But and like, like you said, right now, we're selling ourselves using the internet through different platforms. That takes us to another subject of the fourth industrial revolution. Beautiful. Right. Love the subject. Yeah, so this podcast is about survival skills for the 21st century and 24th cent- uh, the 21st century. Uh, we at the beginning still, and it seemed like the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. Yes. What is your overview of what the next five years will look like? Or say, the, uh, wh- at which point we'll have to see a very significant change in the way we live, you know, with the self-driving cars coming all sorts of different things. AI, at what point do you think it's going to be a switch where life is not the same anymore? I think life already Mm. is not the same as it was before. Right. Here you've got YouTube stars, Mm. multi-millionaires, massive followings. How did they get there? Why is this person more successful than a top lawyer? We're already there. Life is already different. Right. That's the first thing. When it comes to the fourth industrial revolution, what they're talking about is information at your fingertips and the ability to be able to interact with the world in a more digital way that Mm. was never like that before. That's the fourth industrial revolution. So if we're looking at you as a professional interacting with the fourth industrial revolution and the world, all you really need is a laptop, Mm. an internet connection and a telephone. If you've got those three things, you can open up a shop on eBay, you can get involved in telesales, you can be a consultant, you can be a a, a virtual secretary. So the fourth industrial revolution means that you don't need to have the office space, work for someone else to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. But so now how do you interact with the fourth industrial revolution? So you have to be tech savvy. You have to be able to understand how your laptop works so that if you get an error message on it because you can't seem to get the Zoom audio working, Mm -hmm. to maybe quickly go to your device manager and see if you can update your driver on your motherboard because maybe the driver on the microphone hasn't been updated in a while. For sure. Now, that's something that you need to know. Or... You, you, you're going somewhere and you know that you're going to have um, a chat on your cell phone and you know that potentially you're going to be in the car for three hours. So make sure you have a power bank for your phone. Yeah, for sure. That's the fourth industrial revolution. It means that you're not relying on somebody else to be able to operate. So technology allows us to operate. This is, in my opinion, the fourth industrial revolution. Mm. A nice example is Amazon Web Services. So our business, the way that it works is that we we would have back in the day needed to have a big multi-million rand server downstairs in our office yes. to be able to interact with our clients. So we don't need that anymore because Amazon Web Services gives you a cloud-based server. For sure. Plug and play, pay as you go, if you know how to set it up and so on. That immediately allows a young startup like ours to be able to compete on an equal footing with all the other companies. That's the fourth industrial revolution. So a big aspect of the fourth industrial revolution is technology Mm -hmm. and being tech savvy. 
The second one, which I'll just mention before I forget it, is how you treat those that you work with. Okay. And that is by not treating them like employees, but rather like partners. Right. Okay. And then I'll mention the third one. So then, um, and then I'll come back to the second one because I don't want to forget. The third one is the actual business model itself that you work in. Mm. Our business is known as an organized collaborative. So we're a collaborative of independent professionals that all work together for the business, but the business is is for those that work in the collaborative. Mm -hmm. It's different to a corporate company, a small boutique business, where there's managers, there's bonus pools, and everyone else is a salaried employee. Mm. So those are the three things, is how you interact with those that you're involved with. And the mindset is, we are partners. If you treat people like staff in your business, even if it's your business or, or it's someone or you're just part of it, if you treat them like staff, they will leave like staff. For sure. If you treat them like partners, like equals, like you really want them to be successful, yeah. then you can grow together. So the mindset of how do you interact with those that you work with, they are colleagues, they are not employees. That's a different mindset. Right, for sure. The second thing, the third thing which I mentioned was the actual business model itself. The organized collaborative. Now, weirdly, somebody referred me on to a Stanford University. Or it's Stanford. I think it's Stanford University. Yeah. PhD professor who talks about the topic of flash teams. Like, I'm so glad that there's even a term for it. Mm. So what are flash teams? Well, it's actually exactly what we're doing. So how the organized collaborative work, collaborative works is that you bring together a team of professionals like what you're doing Mm -hmm. you don't work for a business everybody's involved they all do different things in the collaborative and eventually you're going to get paid there's going to be a revenue of some sort you're going to eventually do conferences there's going to be revenue coming into the collaborative and those that are involved will get a cut a slice of that So they're not on salaries, they're involved in the collaborative because they know that this collaborative is their business. It's their lifestyle, they're involved in this collaborative. And when the collaborative eventually makes money, they will benefit, they will get money. Yes. That is a collaborative. Okay, so what these flash teams thing is all about is a client needs a video made. Mm-hmm. They need a video made, a very professional video made. They actually they're going on a two week road show, and they need a a flash production team put together. Yeah, boom. That now you speak in my language. Two weeks. It's the client is paying. You would be able to get one or two camera people, one maybe a lighting person, a driver with a van, and before you know what's going on, you're a production company. For sure. But you're a flash production company. Yeah. Switch on. Switch off. Switch off. Next client, switch on. Last longer, stay on, stay on. Before you know what's going on, the flash teams are a business. Right. That is a very good concept. Yeah. Yeah. So this ties into what we call the gig economy, which is the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. The gig economy means that you as a professional can tap into a platform and offer your services and get paid for those services. Mm. This is the gig economy. Up. Upwork, Toptel, Fiverr, Fiverr etc. Yeah. <coughs> Our business operates in what we call the talent economy. Mm. It's not the gig economy, it's the talent economy. It's the same thing, but it's business professionals that have talent that work in a gig economy system or an organized collaborative mm. as flash teams. And it's interesting because in that industry specifically, it, it's almost unheard of that people would think it would work in that kind of manner because it always has been seen as okay look you have to be attached to a corporation in that kind of in a full-time basis right definitely Mm -hmm. so from a credibility perspective will the clients take you on Mm -hmm. now i believe that the mindset has shifted from um organization brand buying trigger Mm. to professional with experience and skill set buying trigger right so what that means they're not buying the brand and you get whoever you get who works Mm. there, but rather who's the professional, what can they do, what have they been involved in, we'll buy based on that. Right. 
and, and so that's what's happening. So, so it's, it's not just looking at a company name, the brand name, oh, let's go with these guys, but it's almost like they have to assess, have a look, okay, this is visual actually, but who will be on the project? Exactly. Who will be on the project and that's what right. they buy. All right. That's very interesting. They buy who's on the project. And then what happens is when your guys or, or the, the actuaries, the ladies that work in the business have worked in all the other big consultancies, it's, it's clearly obvious that they have the experience. You're not yes. dealing with a bunch of amateurs. Right. So what happens is the clients eventually just land up utilizing you and, and the, the, the contracts roll over. You're a lean business. Mm-hmm. You don't have the expenses. You can charge the client significantly less. But um, still, you know. The quality is identical. Yeah. Right. And then when the client pays, those involved get most of the money. Right. Instead of spending most of the money on ex- and useless expenses. Useless expenses. The person yeah. that comes to water the plants in your fancy schmancy office. Mm-hmm. Someone has to pay that plant company 15,000 rand a month. Right. Okay. So... You don't think you could have maybe had a team meeting every Monday and everybody grabs a jug and everybody quickly goes and waters the plants on their floor. Mm. Like, you didn't think maybe by shaving off 15,000 rand a month, somewhere along the line, you'd be able to give your clients a reduced fee. For sure. No, we're a, we're a professional organization. You know, we, we need marble flooring. <laughs> come, come to our cheese and wine. Let us... Sh- We'd like to sh- introduce you to our new product range. We, we mm. invite people in. And everything is cost, cost, cost. Cost, cost, cost. Yeah. We give away lovely pens. Oh, it's all branding. It's all. Well, the truth is, is that if the client wants to buy the product, mm. you can interact with them in different ways. Yes. You can interact with them on LinkedIn. You don't have to have them come to your office. It's obviously better, but there's the way up. But so someone would say, look, in, especially in the professional world, there just is a mentality or a culture that has been there for a very long time. Yes. How do you break that to make them understand? Because most of them still would want to meet you, you know, uh, are not comfortable com- uh, conversating on LinkedIn, for example, for a very long time. Yeah. Right. So what, what is the proposition? What is the it that you have that you make the, those clients to kind of switch to your model? Okay, so when you're interacting with any client at a high level, mm. you're having some tough conversations. We were saying earlier, it's tough conversations. So if you get the opportunity to talk to a client, you need to try your best very, very early on mm. to present why your business is one that they want to be working with. You kind of have to almost get that out of the way quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're not going to entertain more conversation with you. Okay. So how do you do that? So so, so once once you get hold of them and once you're interacting with them, you probably have about one minute Mm. when you're interacting with them to say, I know you're super busy. I just want to quickly let you know that our business offers the same services as XYZ. Mm -hmm. We come in at a significantly lower rate because we're a lean business. We don't have the office space. Mm. We don't have all the expenses. And when you pay us as an organized collaborative at the end of the month, we pay our actuaries more than double than what they would earn anywhere else. Wow. So they, they, they're not as stressed out. They're earning more. So you're getting a much fresher quality of service at, a, yes. at half the rate. So if this is something that interests you, I would love to engage. Now, that probably took me one minute. Mm. But I was able to really flesh out why this client should interact with us mm-hmm. in one minute. Now, if the client doesn't really care about their budget, they'll be like, to be honest with you, like, I don't care. I don't care what I'm getting, what mm-hmm. I'm being charged. I just, I want to go with a big name brand. Okay. And at least they call, everybody serves time. You know, we all, you don't waste my time. I don't waste your time. If you don't want to go on and there, we just end it right there. One minute. Yeah. But you tell them at the beginning of the conversation. Yes. I know, I know you're very busy. This is not going to take more than about one or two minutes. I promise. Mm-hmm. In that way, they use, okay, you know what? I'll get you off my back. Let's hear your one or two minutes. You've got one or two minutes. Yes. So from the productivity side of things, when you, if you compare, since you've been in the recruiting business for a long time anyway, if you compare this model that you have, that most uh, of your stuff don't really, you know, I would say your team, your collaborators, colleagues, colleagues, colleagues right? yeah, do not have... Um, have to travel to go to work. You know, they work when they're comfortable and it's flexible for them. How do you see their productivity when they don't have to spend two hours on the road going back and forth Such work? an awesome question. Yeah. If you're an office manager mm. in an office 
and you have a floor full of your your, your team members, your colleagues. Mm. Do you think that if you walk up to their desk and have a look at what they're doing on the screen and say, how are you doing, Pete? You doing all right? Eh? Yeah. Just, just let me know if you run into any problems. And you leave. Do you think that that helps you to assess their productivity? No. no. It's a waste of time, that. Yeah. Okay, so we want to have an, a meeting at every morning, 8 o'clock, you know, get our minds right for the day. Well, I can tell you now that we have our 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock morning meetings on Zoom, mm. digital. Some people have their headphones in, they're having breakfast with their families. Some people are on the way to the client. Yeah. A lot of our actors work inside the client's offices anyway. Mm. So what happens is that in order to work out if somebody is working properly, you have to be quite switched on whether they are delivering. You can't just blase, let them just do whatever they want. You have to be able to understand and interact with them yes. and, and talk to them. And, you know, how's it going? Are, you know, are you struggling? Aren't you struggling? Let's talk. But beyond that, on the big projects that have teams, we have our own, ta-da, delivery managers. Okay. So we have professional delivery managers that manage the projects. So they will have daily meetings. They'll have weekly or two or every second week sprint runs on deliverables. Are we meeting those deliverables? Aren't we meeting those deliverables? What should the deliverables be? It's a six month or it's a 12 month project. So let's break it up into pieces. If at the end of the week, it would have been a good week, what would we have uh, achieved? So you have to have professional operational delivery people mm. in those big projects to be able to assess how things are going as you go along. So if somebody kind of tapers off slightly, you can quickly realign, readjust, get the whole team back on track. Right. So you're managing it very, very smartly and, and in quite a rigorous way. That's how we do it. And a lot of people now, they, in South Africa, it's a big subject now. Oh, with the fourth industrial revolution coming, but you say that it's already here. Um, there's a, a lot of people worried about job opportunities being lost. Uh, do you think this is a serious problem as it sounds, or is it just that people haven't really converted yet to understand where the jobs are going and where they are? Someone asked me the same question the other day. Mm. What I think is that some jobs mm. are going to become non-existent. Yes. You, we, we're not going to need you. And other jobs will come out of thin air and be created. Mm -hmm. So I think you will definitely get certain jobs that you don't need. And those people, unfortunately, will find it difficult finding work. But then there'll be other jobs which we haven't really thought of yet that become a thing. For sure. Like, an, like a social media manager. That was never the case. There was no such thing. I mean, just sure. a couple of years ago, five, six, seven, eight years ago, you, social media manager, what are you talking about? Now, it's probably one of the biggest jobs around. Right now, yeah. It's popular. It's popular. So mm. now, what were those guys doing before? They were doing something else. So that tapered off, and now they are a social um, media manager, a campaign manager, art you know, uh, magazine campaigns and linking it with radio ads and linking it with Instagram influencer, Instagram influencer. Yeah. There was never such a thing. For sure. So some jobs I think will taper off mm. and others will become a thing. And I think we live in, a, in an optimistic, positive country. I think what you don't want to do, in my opinion, is be stuck having conversations with people about how myth things are mm. because you're just going to go down this like spiral of mythness. Uh, this, uh, yeah, hell no, we won't go, hell, hey, <coughs> hey Tim, there's a march, let's go to the march, marches are important, they are yeah. important, do you have a job? You still don't. You, so, so you don't have a job, mm. so I appreciate the fact that you want to march, but maybe you should have sat home that day and sorted out your CV. Your LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn profile, maybe made some phone calls to, to go and get some work. You can always march. But if you're angry and you're pissed off because there's no jobs, and, okay, well, are you trying to find a job? I am trying to find a job. Okay, cool. But that one day when you went to the march, it's an important thing to do, mm. but you don't have a job. So that one day, imagine if you had phoned 15 people that day. Right. You could have got a job. 
Because I, sometimes it's a volume, it's a volume thing. Sometimes. Definitely. Yeah. So now you get the job. Okay. So now you believe in a cause that you feel needs to be shouted from the hilltops. Cool. Yeah. So on the Sunday when you're not working, now you can go to the march. Right. You sorted yourself out. There's no point in being aggressive about stuff that is kind of out of your hands, but then at the sa- or angry about that, but then you're not really trying to help yourself. Mm. It's interesting. I think it's a macro and micro, the macro and micro problem, yeah. you know, and there's a very a tricky balance. difference. Yeah, it's a very tricky balance. Tricky balance, you know, you, yeah. there's causes, but at the same time, you want to help yourself. So, so now somebody offers an online course. Yeah. I can tell you now that there are a million reasons why you can't do something. A million. Mm. But there's also many, many reasons of how you can do something. Yes. You know, now you've got a cell phone, so it's not like you're going to miss that phone call. If you go do that thing. So go do that thing. Hmm. You've got your phone with you. You've got your email with you. If somebody needs to get hold of you, they can still do it. So I think technology enables you to, to help yourself. Yes. Y- you know, and also you have to be outgoing. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is if you want to uplift yourself and your life, you have to be able to help yourself. Okay. You can't be sitting at home on your uncle or your auntie's couch and like, don't you know anybody who can give me a job? Hmm. Because you're sitting on the couch hiding away from the world. Right. That is a very good point. You have to be outgoing. It's very easy to maybe go to the waterfront, go to startup events. Yes. Go do things. Go to different things and inter- you see somebody at the grocery store. Excuse me, ma'am. You look like a businesswoman. This is not going to take long. I don't mean to bother you. Would it be possible if I just asked you what you did? I'm, I'm curious. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm out of work, but I'm, I'm not asking you for a job. I'm just curious what you do. Yes. Well, you know, we work in the travel industry. Oh. Is, are this, is, is it still a booming industry? Very much so. She might just say to you, you got a you got a license to drive a car? Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. Well, you know, the honest truth is, I was just sitting with somebody yesterday. They got a travel destination business, and finding good drivers is tricky. Do you feel you'd also be able to interact with the guests? You you seem like an outgoing person. Yes. Actually, yes, very much so. Okay, great. Well, here's Tina's number. Give her a call. Tell her that I past you on you can drive and you can interact with guests so you know i don't know what will become of it now isn't that magic right you know that is a very good example you give there but then (laughs) the way we are trained to think about work or jobs and how you find them is very different you know people look at uh, at it in a very linear way that okay i have my degree now all i have to do is look for ads and apply to them right but then for a person like yourself, obviously you know that you know on an ad there have been hundreds of people applied for it. Probably you're looking for more new creative ways to do it, and being out- outgoing is really helpful. Okay. And I-, I think being, like you said, being outgoing is must be regarded as a skill now in the fourth industrial revolution because it's very, very important. Critical. You know, help. it's like saying I'm very introverted, so I can't do that. It's kind of a it won't help you as much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that, so to, I agree with you. Right. I think that if you do find yourself being an introverted type person, mm. then maybe rather approach people in, 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 a, in a different way. Write some poetry. Okay. You know, um, and um, or, or write emails, like not long emails. The, somewhere along the line, you have to go buy food. You have to go try and find a job. Even if you're an introvert, unfortunately, you have to try to get out of your comfort zone. Yes. So, so that's the thing is, is really, but you, you never know where it's going to lead to. And uh, some people, it's easier to do that. But, but what I can guarantee is if you are an introvert and you do manage to find a job, you'll probably find a job that requires somebody who doesn't really like to be like what we call front office. Yes. And so the chances on you're not going to get a front office job anyway. You're probably going to get a back office job. Great. Now you sorted yourself out. But you definitely have to get out of your comfort zone and go out there and, and try to, to make something of yourself. Just give me the, 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 the title of, of this talk again so I can just realign what some of the key points that maybe we can discuss is. This yeah. is what the strategy of? 
this talk. The, no, this talk yeah, is the, 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 uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So we're talking about how do you say prepare yourself uh, and align yourself within the the new economy so okay. that you can you can survive. Okay. Yeah. So the f another topic is you as a brand. Yes. Okay, you as a brand, because the truth is, is we're so connected these days that you really need to give people the impression that you as a brand is, is, a, is a quality brand. Okay. Okay. LinkedIn's a good one. Facebook is a good one. What you don't want to be doing on Facebook, let's say, is complaining about stuff all the time. Oh, I, I know. I know. You know, and like just posting inappropriate stuff. Mm. Which is like grotesque. For sure. Because what happens is is that somewhere along the line, people are looking at that and now you're applying for a job or, or, or you, you want to join a club of some sort, which is an exclusive club. And now people see that you're, you as a brand is, 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 is rogue. It's a bit unreliable. Mm. You're doing yourself a disservice in the fourth industrial revolution if you don't present in quite a a charming together way I'm not saying that um, if, if there are certain topics that are hot topics and and that something has to be said you say your thing mm -hmm. but say it in a classy way say it in a classy way just say you know I, I've, I've seen what you've written I, I, I don't specifically agree with what you've said mm. may I suggest that my point in my view is this we might not agree, but this is my viewpoint. All the best. Right. Isn't that a different way to saying, like, Hey, what the hell are you talking about? You people are all the same. Mm. Whoa, buddy. And, the, and there's also an issue of social cues to that, of like, there are certain topics that are hot right now, right? And it's very important to kind of keep that in mind. Or, you know, for a lot of, I was in, at a conference the other day, and there's a guy who was making an example about women, right? You already know how hot that subject is right now. Yeah. And he's making kind of a, in a very demeaning way, kind of an old school mentality thing, you know. And I, I see people doing that on Facebook, on Twitter. It's like you don't really know how that translates to a lot of people, you know. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, you know, the, in this day and age that we're in, back in the day, if you wanted to open a business, you would talk to people about it, get their viewpoint. This is the name of the company. What do you think? These days, if you think that it's good, mm. just do it. If you like the name, go with it. Because someone else's opinion is subjective. It's their opinion. They might be wrong. Yes. Imagine you say, oh, I love the blue. This is the theme of our, our towels that we make. It's aimed at girls, but we're going for a bluish, light blue, because I'd like the girls to be able to tap into their um, heaven and earth chakras. Yes. Beautiful, you know? Go with it. Then someone said, no, no, no. Girls, only pink and orange. Oh, is it? Now, do you have to change? Do I have to keep it? Pink and orange, terrible. Yeah. So the key really is, in a weird sort of a way, there's no right or wrong. This is kind of like one of the take-homes. If We don't have much time. One of the take-homes is there's no real right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Only about how you apply and action your idea. Because, like, you know, I went to this award ceremony competition the other day. And I thought I was going to win. Mm. Like entrepreneur of the year. I thought I was going to win. You know, I really did. Like, let's talk about it. Why should I win? Well, you know, let's talk about how you're running a business. What's the industry? I thought I had my points that were justified to win. Mm -hmm. And I didn't win. So I could have done one of two things. I could have complained about it. Like overseas, sometimes people release books. What went wrong? Like, yeah lost didn't win being angry about it like what are you talking about yeah so the mindset is not i should have won ba, ba, ba. i'm right you wrong no the real lesson is okay i didn't win that competition but you know what mm. we're doing brilliantly 
in my opinion, we we do, we're the best. For that, we're doing great. Mm. If some people that judge us didn't feel that we should have won, that someone else, what am I supposed to do? I accept that, but we are still right. Yes, our business is still pumping. Our vision, our ideas, it's still right. I can't say, oh, we didn't win that, so guys, maybe we're not getting it wrong. I can't allow other people's influence to detract from my vision. Yes. Of you spot a gap, you see an industry or a product or a service that you think your industry should have. You can ask a few people about it, but if one of the big machers in the industry says it's a shocking idea, you'll never get it off the ground. You mustn't take that on. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I had four different ideas before launching Virtual Actuary, okay. post-recruitment. Four different ideas. I dissected those ideas for two years, but I dissected them. I wasn't happy with them. Okay, so it was to do with you, not because of what just, everyone else was saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when I came up with my idea, people were skeptical. Like, why would they want to buy from you instead of the big four consultancies? What? Well, doesn't yeah. make sense. Who the hell are you? No, I believe that if we can prove to them that this is how we do things, this is what we're all about, my belief is that they will buy from us. Yes. And we went with it. So I guess really one of the take-homes is you are armed with technology. You're armed with the ability to be able to interact with business professionals like you've never, ever been able to. Yeah. Go out there. Sleep early. You know, go to sleep early. Don't be partying all the time. And mix and interact with the right types of people. Don't get into business with people that are, that are rogues, that are big talkers. Mm. They haven't really achieved much. They just have a big lip. Right. Interact with people that rather maybe a little bit more humble, put in good work. If you're going to start a business with somebody, make sure that they have the right characteristics that you're not going to get let down by them. You know, and if you ask them some quality questions, they should be able to give you a quality answer back. And these days in South Africa, we're actually doing brilliantly in this country. Mm, okay. You know, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. You know, we got wonderful infrastructure. Excuse me, the refuge gets collected. We've got water, we've got electricity. And if we don't, then come up with a plan to go work in a shared office space. Yeah. You know, every country has their issues. Yes. When have we ever been able to interact with the world digitally like we are now? Never been before. Flights are relatively affordable. If you want to go see a client, go see the client. And I read that you were approached by a couple of big guys who, and you turned down the deals. That was like a year ago. Wow. That was like, that was a long time ago. Mm. They wanted a, that, how much to buy you out. So to be quite honest with you, our valuation now is nothing compared to what it's going to be like in four years' time. Yes. There's no point now. We're having fun. We're enjoying it. So, yeah, we, some of the biggest insurtech deals in the world have just happened. We just, there was, a, there was an organization in the U.S. called... I can't remember, but they sell insurance and they, they, they do something in insurance. They're in InsurTech. They were just bought over by, I think, like Prudential or something for like, like billions. Oh, wow. Billions. Crazy money. What we call panic money. Panic money. Panic money. <laughs> do you know what panic money is? I don't know, but I, I kind of have an idea, I think. Panic money is the big corporate panics because mm -hmm. they're a multi-billion dollar company. And they panic because they think that if they don't swallow you up soon, oh. you're going to take them over. Right. So what's going to happen is they panic. So instead of giving you a valuation, which is where you're at at the moment, they, and, and I believe quite rightly so, mm. they value your business at a much higher level based on the potential of the business that you can pick up and take away from them. Right. So they don't value at current value. They value at, in five years' time, if this company carries on with what they're doing, they will take us out. Right. So we should just give them a deal they can't deny. Panic. Give them a deal that they can't deny. Now, you get it right. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at Facebook, they bought WhatsApp. They, you know, bought Instagram. Instagram. They, they nailed it. But look at the valuation. And they have bought a, a whole lot of companies that they, they just really bought and destroyed pretty much. They just... It's, it's, it's a little bit of smart and yeah. at the same time a little bit of panic. For sure. So, so, so the truth is, is we're building a business, you know, we don't want to get bought over. Right.
And lastly, we're looking to take it out. I'm, I'm interested. Maybe I'm missing something. It seems like you you like awards and you you pay attention to them. I wonder what what, what do they mean to you? Because for me personally, I think that um, I'm not really a fan of awards of any sort. You know, I think it's more status than um, actual substance. And sometimes you subject yourself to uh, feeling in a certain way just because based on what other people think. Because the judges, you know, they don't have all the answers. There's a whole myriad of um, circumstances that has to come together for them to pick someone. It doesn't mean they're the best or the worst, but you never know, right? So it's a very hard to rank who is, especially in business or even art, you know. I don't know what they mean to you. What they mean to me is quality talking points Okay. when interacting with big clients. Okay. That's all it actually means. So to you is another sale. It's another sale. Right. It's another sales point. Right. What are your key selling points? Mm. Well, you know, we were, we, were, we were business of the year last year. Okay. Entrepreneur of the year, founder of the year. Best new, best new company of the year. Mm-hmm. You know, later on today, there's an event, we're going, yeah. we could win it. We, it's not about winning it, it's really about being able to put it on your LinkedIn profile to say, Entrepreneur of the Year, Business of the Year, Startup of the Year, 2019 National Startup Awards, South Africa, boom. <laughs> now, when, US the real sales guy. <laughs> sure, when, when a company overseas is either looking to use one of the big four consultancies in mm. Asia, or you... And all of a sudden you're knocking on their door. Well, okay, well, I'll have a quick look at you. Who are you? I read your profile. Hmm. Startup of the year. Mm. That's interesting. Okay. Hmm. Okay, let's have a chat with them. For sure. You are aiming for let's have a chat with them. Right. So it's social status basically is important. Very important. And then right. recognize social status. Yeah. Yeah. Credibility is very, very important when the stakes are high. Yes. When the clients have got big spending money, they want to do like like if somebody sends me a request to pitch to 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 a quote for a quote to do some work for them. Yes. Hi, we're a big con- we're a consultancy. Blah blah blah. You know, we've got a client. We want you to do some work. I okay, no problem. So I look at the email address and I go to the website. Mm. Who are these guys? And I say, no, this website isn't up and running yet. So what do you do? Thank you very much. It's not exactly the work we, we, want. we look at. Yeah. We want it. We don't look at it. For sure. If you had a website, you had a presence, I've got the person's name on LinkedIn, they look credible, they've commented on some articles, what are the comments like? Yeah. Are they, are they quality, optimistic comments, or does this person seem to slate people? Mm. So I'm quickly making a judgment call as a client or as a service provider to say, do I want to interact with this person and their company? Yeah, so the qualifying aspect these days has changed eh? because now people are looking at everything. They can go to your Facebook profile and look you up and you know, LinkedIn and probably Instagram and be able to come with a very um, kind of informed idea of who you are. Definitely. Right. People want to work with people that are reliable, mm. especially if they're spending money. Of course. So, so that's the whole thing about where we're at in this day and age is you can achieve a level of professionalism in your life and your career if you understand that technology allows you to be somebody in this world mm-hmm. it's kind of a little bit of show and tell it's kind of a little bit of fake until you make it sure mm-hmm. you're not going to put a picture up of you in your in your in your gown just getting out of the shower yeah no this is the real me being myself. Yeah, you know, this is me being myself. Ah, I drink beer, you know, I drink Guinness straight out the bottle. Mm-hmm. You don't like me? Yeah. I don't give F. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Hmm. People won't buy from you. People won't interact with you. So I don't complain tomorrow that, oh, nobody want to hire me. But I'm just being myself. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a professional world out there. Right, for if sure. If you're in the business world. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about art now. We're not talking about the arts. We're of talking course. about proper business strategy. I'll give you a little nugget. Of, of how we launch, and this will kind of be one of the last things we'll say, because I think we're potentially running out of time. For sure. How do you launch a business on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and so on? Well, 
I had spent 10 years building up a database of actuaries or a network of actuaries, one phone call at a time, phoning them at the office. Yes. And I got a hold of a massive list, phoning them at the office, getting to know them a bit, getting the cell phone number, Gmail, and so on. Thank you very much and goodbye. That's how I built up the network for the recruitment. Yeah. So now, six, uh, eight, nine years down the line, now you want to pivot. You want to go towards an actuary consulting business. So how do you tell the industry about you? Well, how? Email marketing. You'll get, you know, you'll get flagged for spam. For sure. Ah, oh, we're going to have a golf day. We're going to invite everybody. Ah, that's, we're going to have an event. It's a bit of an old school way of doing things. Mm. You know what that event's going to cost you? Is it really going to help? You're going to give out some pamphlets and some key rings and... Free food. Free food. It works, but it's expensive. Like, that's old school. What did we do? We took the Access database. Yeah. Which is like Excel, Access. And we converted it into a .csv file, a contacts file. Yeah. We then went to Gmail and uploaded all those contacts as Gmail contacts. For sure. I then synced my Android phone with my Gmail contacts, and those contacts became contacts on my phone. I then went to Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, all that, and say, find friends, find contacts. Yeah. And like the push of a button, it found all of them. Hey, I see you know Mary de Villiers. Hey, I see you know Jacques Dupree. I see you know um, Grace de Bella. I see you know all of them. Hmm. Do you want to connect with them? For sure. Connect, 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 follow, 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 follow. Before you know what's going on, you're interacting with your entire industry on your phone, looking at the Instagram photos, putting some, some, some quality content out there, and they're looking at this going, hey, this company exists. For sure, they're doing great things. They're doing great things. Yeah. Now, you, you, now you've got articles. And I've got like a WhatsApp list, you know, actuaries in the news. These are all the actuaries in South Africa. We Stuff that happens, like a link to this, I'll post it. That is very important. Yeah, you're creating groups just to keep people around, right? I think that they are interested in their industry. For sure. Is it newsworthy enough for you to tap on my shoulder and say, I wasn't sure if you saw this, just wanted to let you know. Mm. You're not pushing sale. You're not pushing eh, we a have product. A, a pro, do no. you want to buy from? No. no. Actuaries in the news, we're in the same industry. I thought you'd find this interesting. I thought you might enjoy what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And people bring other people over. Oh, this is my friend. He's an actuary guy too. Bring him in. Oh, I saw you guys were doing this. Oh, I saw you had a presence. Yeah. It's all digital. It doesn't cost anything. For real, just time a bit of time you're lying mm. in bed you're at the gym you're between sets you know obviously you look like you go to the gym as well you know you're between sets you know, so have a look right. and see what's going on For maybe sure. drop a comment you know nice you know oh like someone's photo you know it's not it, it's genuine right for sure you're interested to see oh hey Yashin I see you traveled oh, you bump into him at the gym hey Yashin yeah, now you get the, the two is actually d do the job for you because you know, anniversaries you don't have to remember everything, the birthdays and everything. You just go in, hey, happy birthday, or congrats, so everything. So, like you said, it's just a matter of putting in a little bit of time, be genuine about things, and you know, you, you, you'll be able to keep a network and eventually grow it. I suppose that's the most important part as well. I believe so. I, be, I believe you need to nurture your network in your industry. Yes. If you can do that in a nice way, when you look back after five years, you say, you know what? Mm. I've, got, I've got a network. I've got, I'm, I'm, in, I'm interacting with my industry. You know, it seems like you see a lot of things online that you pay attention to. Like, oh, that is just not the way to do it. What are the examples that you see? You get buffered. But, oh, that's just not, that's just not it. So what I always find amazing mm. is when... I see one of our big competitors posting like, I mean, these are old school companies. They've been around a long time. Sure. Now they're posting about the future of work and innovation. <laughs> you know, like, and like the fourth industrial revolution. The honest truth is nothing could be further from the truth, buddy. <laughs> you know, you're a big corporate. Right. You know, your shareholders are taking most of the money. Your guys are like sweating, you know? Yeah, yeah. And now you're talking about the future of work and accommodating people working from home. Oh, okay, I see ya. Well, are you paying... How are you paying them? Are you paying them brilliant rates? Oh, we pay them the, the same as what we pay the salaried staff, but they're doing less hours. Mm. Well, that's not really helping anybody. You... You're just repackaging keywords. For sure. So, so I, always, I always find that the most funny, the funniest, 
when I see my big competitors like posting stuff about future of work, innovation, you know, <laughs> studies that have been shown, you know, people are da 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 da. But at the same time, they're not doing anything about changing the lives of the people involved, even. Yeah, changing lives, but at the same time, changing their entire business model. Right. Like, let's say one of our big competitors had to like launch an announcement. They are downscaling ninety percent of their office space. Yeah. And everybody's going to be working as flash teams and global nomads from home. Oh wow, for sure. If that, if, if like an announcement like that came out, I'd be like, "This is real, for sure." At least. That's tricky to compete with because yeah. now they 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 know the industry, they're professionals, they've got the the money to be able to set up cloud servers. Like they can really properly compete with us. But but you see, the thing is, you are you're running the show. You're the man on the center right now making things happen you're one guy you have ownership skin in the game directly these companies don't have everybody there is kind of an employee right don't you are you aren't you scared that you would end up at the same position when it grows too big where nobody really feels the responsibility of ownership such an awesome question so the truth is is that our business being a collaborative means i'm not actually running the show myself okay is that the actuaries are very very involved in building the business and then what also happens is we actually went through a process of splitting our share class mm. between founder shares and investor shares. Now, most small companies don't talk about this at all. They don't, yeah. They so say, I want to bring in an investor because we do. We want to be an institutional big business. Yeah. But we want to still have the small business culture and ethos. Okay. We don't want a big business to come in $30 million or more or less and start telling us what to do and turn us into a, just another big corporate. Yeah, for sure. So we split the share class. Founder shares and investor shares. We could sell off 70% equity yeah. as investor shareholder to, to the investors who would buy investor shares. We would still, the 30% founder, founder shareholders share. would have more than 51% voting rights. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. But I'm also curious before we close, uh, why would you want investment right now? Like, What would you use that money for? So we would use that money to be able to maybe do some road shows if we wanted to okay. go visit clients overseas. Like at the moment, we're only able to bring actuaries in that are not that that don't mind not getting a guaranteed salary immediately. Like we have to have contracts ready okay. for them to join, and like we've just opened up in Australia and in Brazil. Like if we had a bit of cash, I could just quickly fly there interact with the people mm. maybe teach them a little bit about our business and what is the best way to interact with the world now we have to do, do it digitally which i, I don't mm. mind but if we had the cash a, a second thing is we're busy building our online platform okay so at the moment we have to kind of like develop it with just some of the profits that we're making mm. but if i had a team of dedicated developers helping to build that that we were paying that would really help some of our actuaries especially our co-ceo johan who's mm. really he's, he's an amazing actuary currently he's contracted to clients and he's making money as a, a working if we could cover his salary and he could work full-time on the business itself the business would do better faster yes so we want to be an institutional business in order for us to actually take on the big corporates overseas that we're looking to take on mm. we're never ever going to be able to do it as a small homemade business so from for a lot of entrepreneurs do you, should you when you're looking for scale should you use your own money or you, should, you must always aim for investors money what is your philosophy no, no, no. around that my philosophy is that People glorify startups that have done big raises. Oh, look, they ra raised around yeah. 10 million. Amazing. I believe that you should glorify the companies that haven't done a raise that have clients. Yes, for Let's sure. Let's talk about your traction. What kind of clients have you got? Mm. How many people are interacting with your business? That is, that's what you need to glorify. If you can get over the hill of developing your product marketing and eventually launching your product eventually tr getting some clients in and now you're you've got traction you've got clients we got we got like f over 40 clients now you're doing something now you can do a round of raising properly to expand and globalize proper yes like the lawyers documents to convert all the contracts to overseas territories yeah for sure like you can do that you know. that's a lot of money yeah it's, it's probably two hundred thousand rand 
for sure. That's a lot of money. We have to like wait until we've got the 200,000 rand and then we can spend it. But do I spend it on this? Do I spend it on that? Instead of just, just do it, it can be done. We'll, we'll have a slight burn rate, but not a hectic burn rate. So I think that there's a time and a place to get an investor in. You don't want to do it when you're desperate. Mm. And, and if you can, you don't want to do it right at the beginning of the company. Okay. But then if you're smart enough to have split the shares, when you bring them in yeah. to answer your question, they will buy in. But you will still be able to maintain the mindset of being a smaller startup, smaller culture. It's a big business, yeah. but you're not beholden to the shareholders saying that your revenue has to increase at the detriment of quality. You need to pay your people less. Oh, yeah. Now you, it's, beca- it's becoming just like the other big companies. The, we're not happy with the profit margins. We, we need more. Let's have a vote. <laughs> okay, done. Now all of a sudden. Rest prices. Done raise prices you got teams of people mm. you have no choice yeah a de- sorry a decision has been made in the boardroom of course the shareholders yeah we can't be paying you this much it doesn't make sense to them anymore i don't know what to say to you they're investors they smart people they know what's right no they're chasing the profit mm. so if you find the right investor who sees the vision of where you're going with the business yeah that's who you want to bring into the business not when you're desperate for sure. Oh, yeah, that is when you don't want to raise money. That's when you don't want to raise money. Yes. So we've been able to jump over those rounds of raising. We also went through this exercise of splitting the shares. And, uh, and that has put us, in my opinion, in a good position to bring in an investor. Um, at the same time, we don't want to do it just yet because we're busy developing our IP platform, uh, intellectual property platform. Yes. And we'll be significantly more appealing and, 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 and more valuable once mm. that's up and running. We'll probably just double your valuation after. It will, it will quadruple it. <laughs> there you go. So it's worth the wait. It's, eh? w- it's worth the wait. Yeah. So what keeps on happening is we keep it. Well, actually, like I've been chatting with investors. and know we would want to see you one client, 10 clients, 40 clients. And, we, and then we like, then we do that. Yeah. And then so if we get to that point, I say, okay, well, do we really need the investor? So we might never get an investor. Right. We might never want to. But the aim is to be an institutional business and that you're going to do it properly. So you should always aim for what would an investor find appealing about your business and go do that. Yes. I see a lot of startups. It's almost like raising money has become as important as creating the product itself, where they stop everything. And then all they're doing is always trying to raise money, money instead of generating business, getting more clients and, you know, having numbers to show. Such a stuff up because what's going to happen is you're going to spend months and months and months interacting with those investors. Mm going through all the paperwork then they bring in their like term sheet which is so complicated to understand and they say we want to see your figures what right. is your projections you want to get x amount well the figures the don't make sense to match yeah no problem give them the figures just punt it mm. you do that and then a year down the line two years you don't hit those numbers then they say to you oh <laughs> we gave you the cash. Now they said, "Look, we try consciously. We do well." Then they yeah. said, "No, you know what? If you look at clause eighty-six point four point five, it says that if in twenty-four months you read this, of course, mm. if after twenty-four months you don't hit these numbers, you're gonna have to. You have to give us twenty-five percent of your shares for one rand. So they've bought fifty. You're like, ah, yeah, we got forty-five. Perfect. You know, cool." Now, all of a sudden, two years' time, you don't hit those numbers because you've been burning money on their ex-co members that have come into the business. They're telling you what to do. Yeah. You didn't hit those figures. There's a clawback clause. We claw back 20% of your shares. Now, now you've got 20% of your own business. Nothing's changed. Mm. Just taking more equity out. They've taken more equity out because now you've got this crazy investor. You didn't understand how to interact with them. Now you find yourself as an employee in your own business. For sure. <laughs> so there's a lot of things happening in the startup world. It's not about just raising cash. Oh, you need to... I started this business. I started this business on my savings and my credit cards. Right. Hectic. Like he- super hectic. hectic. But I mean, for me, that's the only way I understand of starting a business. I really don't understand this thing of, oh, we have the, a business plan. I want to raise money. I, I know people do it. I just don't get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not the right approach. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Man, I don't want to take so much of your time, but you know, this was fun. Thanks. We ended up spending over an hour <laughs> because it was that good. Thank you. So I'm sure a lot of people watching there learned a lot. Uh, where, where can they find you? If you Google 
virtual actuary. Yeah. Yes. Maybe you, now you can look at the camera probably now. <laughs> we are finalists in the Startup Awards. If you go to www etc etc vote for us please every vote counts oh sorry wrong 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 message if you google virtual actuary you will find us everywhere you can get hold of me in a million different ways please reach out and uh, i guess don't forget to vote for sure awesome cool is there anything else you want to talk about that's it awesome